Good morning, and thank you for the invitation. It's great to be in a room again with woodworkers. Um, it's been a long time for me, at least. <clears throat> this talks about hide glue, and it's about hammer veneering. Um, hide glue is, is, the, is the vehicle. Hammer veneering is one of the many things that you can do with hide glue. Um, the real choice is be, when you're cho choosing to veneer is you either hammer it or you press it. And you can press it mechanically or you can press it with a vacuum press. Um, and um, I'm here to try to persuade folks that if you have a shop in which you use hide glue, it is a very easy and quick way of getting some fairly complex veneering done. Um, I'd like to show you some examples. This is a, um, um, this is a table <coughs> where I'm sure you've all seen these ray patterns and you've probably seen them um, done with a vacuum press with a spectacular amount of veneer tape holding it all together and a fair amount of time invested in getting all that tape in one place and getting it to work and it's then stuck in a press. This particular table has um, this banding. Well, it's, you've got the, the rays, you've got the, the cross banding on the edge, that's hammer veneered on, and this barber pole banding that's going around it is hammer uh, veneered on. Um, it, of this table, I could easily see somebody sticking it in a vacuum press to do the rays. I could be persuaded you could do something around the edges with PVA glue. I have no idea how you would do that barber pole uh, banding without hide glue. So um, we're going to talk about this table in a little more detail. This is another example. It's a <coughs> Portsmouth table. Um, this drawer has mitered, it's kind of mitered edges. It's got an inlay in the middle. That was all hammer veneered. And then um, this top is book matched swirl mahogany. Uh, this, this edging is uh, solid mahogany and the holly inlay was laid in afterwards. So this one's a combination of um, hammer veneering, traditional inlay stringing, um, and solid hardwood edging. This table, again, this drawer, the center field was laid down, the, the uh, holly stringing was laid in, and then the cross banding was laid on, mitered, and then the, the um, cock bead was put on the drawer. So it's all built from the inside out. This is also uh, book match swirl mahogany, but this entire top is an, an MDF substrate. Um, this is hammer veneered down using um, a butt joint, and we'll talk about the difference between overlapping pieces and cutting them down and using a butt joint and when you would pick one over the other and why. Uh, after the center field is laid down, the um, stringing is is put in and mitered and then the cross banding is laid down all using hide glue and this particular top has a very small maybe I don't know not even a quarter of an inch thick solid solid uh, mahogany edging on it that's kind of eased into a, a slight curve um, so this is a variety of of things that can be done you know, using the um, using hide glue. So we're going to talk about the history a little bit, properties, uses. Um, we're going to demonstrate a rub joint, hammer veneering, uh, some, some embellishments. And I have a, a video that I used at another presentation of grain filling. That's one of the things that can be done and is very useful with hide glue. Um, uh, not commonly, a lot of people aren't even aware you can do it, uh, but uh, in my opinion it beats any of the commercial grain fillers. And then uh, we're going to have a little video on how that ray pattern was actually veneered. So 
you know, what I hear often is, I got PVA glue, it works fine. Why are you bothering me? Okay? So we're going to talk a little bit about what problems hide, uh, hide glue solves, what functionalities it enables. So there are things you can do with hide glue you can't do with PVA glue. What flexibilities it offers and what challenges it brings. And some of the myths that, you know, is that it's messy, which could be true depending on how you use it, uh, requires extensive preparation. I'll talk about that in a minute. Requires expensive equipment. That's simply not true. Um, the open time is way too short. That is also simply not true. And it is not as strong as PVA glue, and that is absolutely not true. Um, but the argument about strength, you know, keeps coming up no matter how many times you have it. You know, I put salt in it or urea to make, extend the open time, and that somehow weakens the joint. Um, if adding an additive to hide glue makes it weaker, which is not proven. Um, all the hide glue uh, that has ever been used is stronger than the wood joint. So this argument about PVA glue is stronger than hide glue, if they're both stronger than the wood joint, what, what is the point of that discussion? It, it's, you know, it just doesn't make sense to me. So if you go on luthier websites, they will swear that hot hide glue has the strength of epoxy. And if you go on websites that are selling PVA glue, they'll tell you that hide glue falls apart and it's terrible stuff. So pick your poison. Okay, these are some of the attributes of hide glue. And the unique thing about hide glue is when you have PVA glue and you want to do something, you want PVA glue with a slightly extended open time, you have to go out and buy a different brand of PVA glue. If you want to have something that, I, that won't leach through veneers. You have to go out and buy a different PVA glue or resin glue or something else. Hide glue is unique. You can mix things into it to make it do almost anything you want. Um, for example, uh, it provides glue joints that last for centuries. That's a fact. Um, it's been used. There is evidence of protein glue being used by the Neanderthals to glue feathers onto, onto spears. So, uh, still around. Uh, it's extremely strong, uh, has properties that are easily modified. In red here, it's easily reversible. That, that makes hammer veneering possible and makes it worth the time to look into because you can undo just about anything. It has uh, unlimited shelf life. Until you mix it, it's not going to go bad. It'll stay there for forever. Um, it will have an open time of one minute, or it will have an open time of 30 minutes, depending on what you do to it. Um, it will stick to itself. PVA glue will not. So if you try to fix a chair that has, was fixed with PVA glue, you're going to have to remove all the glue. If it was done with hide glue, then the hide glue, will re when you put it on, will reactivate the old hide glue, and it will all be fine. Um, that's also true if you're trying to restore uh, an antique, um, and you lift some of the veneer, all you need to do is to heat it up and lay it down again, and it's, it's going to be fine. Um, it will gel in one minute. So hide glue forms its initial bond when the temperature drops below 95 degrees. It, that's called the gel point. And about 80% of its strength is formed about that point, and the rest of it takes place over 24 hours. Um, and depending on the temperature in your shop and the thickness of your glue and the type of glue you're using, the, the um, gram strength, it could gel up in as quickly as one minute, which is pretty brisk. Uh, you can also fix it so that it will never gel, and that's called liquid hide glue. Um, you can glue without clamps. You can glue with clamps. Uh, you can veneer with a vacuum press or a mechanical press, and I use liquid hide glue for those. Uh, I, I don't use a vacuum press, but I have used mechanical press, and I simply use liquid hide glue. Uh, there's no limit to the size of what can be veneered. Um, Tag Frid um, had a quote, uh, with hammer veneering, you could veneer the entire world if you wanted to, um, because it's just a process of continuing to, to lay on more and more pieces of veneer. Um, 
It's rigid when dry and doesn't creep. So that, that's an important property of hide glue, particularly if you're dealing with laminations and things like that. Uh, it's flexible when dry. I just said it's rigid. Well, how could it be flexible? You add a little glycerin to it and it's very flexible. So if you're a book binder, uh, you know, 200 years ago, you're using hide glue and you're adding um, glycerin to it so that the bindings don't crack. And if you're making a timbre table today and you're, you're gluing the, the back uh, piece of cloth onto it, if you mix a little glycerin with the hide glue, it keeps those joints flexible and prevents them from cracking and snapping. Uh, it will not impact the finish. Um, it can be used as a filler and is non-toxic. So there, that's a lot of attributes for one particular product to have. And what's happened um, is in the 50s, um, PVA glue came out. Um, uh, it was purported to be superior to hide glue. It was certainly more convenient than hide glue if, if you're just trying to glue two pieces of wood together and you're not worried about the finish and a lot of other things. So it became extremely popular. Um, before that, hide glue was the only show in town outside of you know, heat resins and things like that in the manufacturing process. But uh, any shop was using hide glue and everybody in the shop knew all about the attributes of it. So they would know when to add a little urea to it because they needed some open time. They need, they, it was just common knowledge. It was just as much part of you knew how to, you know how to use a table saw and what to do and what not to do. And that's how it was with hide glue. But after four generations of PVA glue, you know, being the replaced, replacing hide glue, a lot of those, that knowledge and attributes have gone away. Um, so today, pr pretty much the only people that are um, advocates, of full-blown advocates of, of, um, of uh, hide glue are furniture restorers like Al Breed or builders um, and um, luthiers. Uh, piano restorers are also uh, big fans. They fix all the hammers with hide glue. In fact, if you wanted to go research hide glue, the best websites to go on are luthier websites. They are active users of hide glue. So there are really two types of hide glue from a practical perspective. Um, there's liquid hide glue and this hot hide glue. And the only difference between the two of them is one of them has an additive like urea or salt at enough proportion weight-wise to suppress the gel point so that it won't gel. That's it. And because it won't gel, it stays liquid at room temperatures. Um, so hot, hot hide glue is good for furniture joints and so is liquid hide glue. If you've got a furniture joint that is going to take you a bit of time to get together and you're a little concerned about it, liquid hide glue is the way to go. Um, veneering. Hammer veneering, you can hammer veneer with hot hide glue. You cannot hammer veneer with liquid hide glue because it won't gel. And the key point of hammer veneering is to get it to gel. A rub joint it can be done with hot hide glue. It can't be done with liquid hide glue because, again, liquid hide glue won't gel. Um, filling and finishing. Uh, hot hide glue, again, uh, you need to... Um, um, apply it to the surface, let it get in the pores, and it needs to gel up and solidify. And if you, you did that with liquid hide glue, you'd be waiting. You could do it, but you'd be waiting a really, really long time to get that surface. Uh. Extreme open time. Uh, that's not an attribute of hot hide glue, but it is an attribute of liquid hide glue. And most liquid hide glues, are you, you can easily get an open time of 30 minutes. So... You know, if you're worried about gluing up dovetails or something like that, uh, liquid hide glue is the way to go. Strangely enough, it's also um, a glue to seriously consider if you're doing biscuits or dominoes. Because um, if you've ever done biscuits, getting all the glue everywhere, by the time you're doing it, everything is all swelled up, you can't, and the glue is setting up, and you can't pull the thing together anymore. With liquid hide glue, you got all the time in the world. So... What's your favorite right now, the Type-On? Type-On what? Uh, liquid hide? No, I, I make my own. It's, make it's just... It's just as easy for you. Yeah. It's, it's easier. easier for you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, 
Well, we're on that. Why don't we? So this is a batch of hide glue. It's sitting in my car overnight, so it's a little stiff. The, the stuff over there is uh, cooking, so we'll we'll have that later. <coughs> yes. Is that made of hide? Is that what hide glue is? Like animal hide? Animal protein, oh. uh, collagens, bone marrow. Um, so I make standard batches. I use the same amount of glue, same amount of water all the time because I want to be able to modify this glue and every, all modifications are done by weight. So it's the amount of weight of, in this case, salt compared to the hide glue. So if I know I have 50 grams of hide glue in here and I know I have 30 grams, uh, 15 grams of hide glue of salt in here, I simply can take this jar, pour the salt in it, cook it for 20 minutes, and I have liquid hide glue. So I can't go to my computer and click on the website and order the hide glue and let it come and then find out that the date code on the stuff I just bought is going to expire next week. Um, <clears throat> so it, it can't be simpler than that. You know? um, so there's, there's really no magic to it. The diff the, the the point is, if you buy into some of the things you want to be able to do with hide glue, <clears throat> you'll set up your shop so that you have a pot like that over there, and you've got a couple of those jars sitting in your refrigerator, and when you want it, you take it out and use it. And if you want it liquid, <clears throat> before I start any project, I take one of those, I add 15 grams of salt to it, I cook it, I put it in a squeegee bottle, <clears throat> like this, and I have uh, this jar will fill this up to about there, and that's the glue I need for that project. And I know it's fresh because I just made it. And this will last unrefrigerated in the workshop for six months or more because all the salt in it, it's the preservatives. So, but I do at night put it in the refrigerator. But after, you, after you've had the arduous task of taking your wrist and pouring 15 grams of salt into your glue and cooking it and then pour it in here, you've got fresh hide glue. So if I was starting a project, this, this glue's probably, I don't know, seven or eight months old. It's still perfectly good. It'll work fine. But if I was starting a new project that I wanted to be around for 100 years, I'd simply make a fresh bottle of this and use the fresh glue on my project and use this in the shop for whatever. <clears throat> and what you're throwing away if you decide to toss this is 50 grams of hide glue, which is, I don't know, <clears throat> about that much, that height. Cost is, I don't know, 50 cents. Um, and a, some water and some table salt. So, yes? The, what's the open time that you have? With, uh, For this? Mix? Yeah. 25, 30 minutes. Um, there are two reasons that on any furniture project I won't use PVA glue. It's not because PVA glue doesn't stick, it sticks fine. But I don't want to have to worry about the finish and the squeeze out. And I don't want to have to worry about rushing, you know, putting clamps on it. I want to be able to take my time. If I wanted to rush, I'd go back to work and, and go to the office. So. Okay, so I came across this book some years ago, and it was put out by the animal glue industry. So they're prejudiced, obviously. Uh, but this is put out in the 50s, and it was all the things that the industries do with hide glue, and it's fascinating reading. And there's a small section in here on woodworking, and these tables um, that are on here came out of, out of this book. So one of the things that you're, you're concerned about when you're going to start using hide glue is what gram strength do I use? There are common strengths that woodworkers default to over the centuries, and they are the 192 gram strength and the 251 gram strength. Um, 
the 251 is a little more brittle. It'll gel faster. Um, people that do hammer veneering a lot like the 251 because it gels fast. And you would think, well, why would I want to do that? <laughs> because I'm trying to get this veneer down and I don't want it to be in the wrong place. Actually, it, you can, the gel time doesn't, re you really want it to grab rather than sliding around your substrate forever. So 251 is, some people prefer it for hammer veneering. I prefer not having to think about a lot of different things. So I use 192 for everything because I know what the ratios are of the water. I know how much salt or urea or glycerin or whatever because all those numbers change when you change the, the uh, gram strength of the hide glue. So I simply buy the 192 stuff and I do everything with it. And if I, if I really wanted the 192 to gel faster, I'd add a little vinegar to it and that'll make it gel faster, It'll make it smell, um, but you, you know, you'd get it to gel. The, the smell is one of the other things. Some people say, I don't like hide glue because it smells awful. They probably bought cheap hide glue um, because I bought some that I thought was, I was getting a bargain and when I cooked it, it was very cloudy and it really smelled awful. It worked fine, but it was just not, it wasn't good. And then I learned that there are high purity and not so high purity. And for a couple of bucks, you get the high purity and it's very clear like this. Yeah, you can pass this around. Um, it's clear like that. If, if it was cheap hide glue, you're not, even if you, you can open it and smell it, but it's not going to smell like anything until you cook it. Um, the, um, yeah. So, so, so that's, that thing that's being passed around, I cooked that yesterday. Um, and I put it in the refrigerator, I put it in the car last night and it was in the garage, so it was, I was worried it was going to freeze. Um, when I want to have, uh, and I'm going to work on a really big project and I want to have a lot of hide glue and I don't want to have to be cooking it constantly, I'll take that jar and I'll take a knife and I'll cut the pieces into little sections and I'll put them in a plastic bag and I'll stick them in the freezer. And any time I want to have, you know, a small piece of hide glue, I can just take one of those out, throw it in the glue pot, and, you know, if I'm doing marquetry, for instance, you don't want a whole jar of hide glue. Um, so, uh, uh, is, he, is, is there a source where you recommend, I mean, is there an online source where you buy the hide glue that you recommend? The stuff I get is from Born Industries. Um, it is on it is on the web. Um, in fact, here it, it's here's his um, his website, and I buy a five pound bag. A pound of it goes pretty quick if you use it a lot, and nothing's going to happen to it if it sits on a shelf for fifteen years. So um, when you add the shipping and everything to this stuff, it's it's worth buying enough to last. So practical mixing of hide glue, I, I don't use this method. I mix my batches very consistently and I mix them by weight because I want to be able to do things with the glue. Um, so I want to know um, what ratio of weight, uh, uh, what weight of water, uh, water and what weight of glue is in there. So any, any formula you see for hide glue is going to be by weight. And um, a simple method is to simply put some hide glue in a jar and pour water in until it's a half an inch above it. Um, and then set it aside for half hour, hour, two hours, whatever. <clears throat> and it's going to turn into a gelatin. Um, it's then ready to cook. And if you put it in, the, in a pot at 140, 145 degrees, it'll become, it'll become regular hide glue. And
it'll look like this. And then you'll take something and pick it up and you want to get a steady stream coming off there. And if it's too thick, add a little hot water. If it's too thin, let it cook for a while. Some people want to add more glue to it. That takes, still takes a while for the glue to do what it's going to do. But hide glue is pretty forgiving. I mean, the only thing that's going to happen if it's a little thick uh, is it's going to gel a little sooner than it will before. But if you know what you're doing, what, what time, what, how much time you have, you know whether you want to thin that glue out or not. What's yeah. the thermometer for? Oh, um, I use that little teapot that has a variable temperature thing, and I like to know that the glue is staying at like 140 to 145 degrees. Okay, so you heat the pot to 140, and then you make sure the glue is 140? No, I, the glue is 140. Oh, the glue is 140. I'll talk about that pot in a minute, but you know, it's got a little plastic top on it, and then I keep a top on top of the, uh, on the glue as well. Um, so there are a couple of things if you, if you if you buy this book on hide glue, it's fairly recently published. Um, this glue has a mesmerizing number of things that it says you can add to hide glue to make it waterproof, uh, to turn lead into gold, to, you know, to, uh, um, but in practice, for, for the way we work today, you, you really, if you needed waterproof glue, go buy a waterproof glue. I mean, you don't want to have to take potassium dichromate, which is toxic, and add it to your hide glue to make it waterproof. You can just buy some type on, what is it, three that's waterproof, yeah, and use it. I don't concern myself with waterproof for period furniture, so it's not a concern for me. So the things that I want to be able to do with it is I want to be able to slow up the gel rate, not make it go away. I want, I want, I've got my hide glue. I know it's going to gel. My shop is cold today. I'm doing dovetails. I probably need five minutes. It's going to, it's going to be a horse race. So if I add, oh, I don't know, five grams of salt to that hide glue, I'll get my five minutes, I'll get 10 minutes of gel time, and it's still going to be regular hide glue. Um, so if you're working on something where you just need a little bit more open time, just you can take some of that, estimate how much you're pouring off, say half of that jar, a quarter of that jar. So if there was 50 grams in that jar, you're pouring off half of 25, 12, and you want by weight, I don't know, um, 5% of that, that's how much salt you throw in there. Um, the guys that did this stuff all the time, they knew that, you know, if I, that much salt in my hand goes into the pot, what it does, but I don't do this every day, so I have to be a little more methodical about it, which is why I use the standard size batch mix that I do. Um, if I just poured some hide glue into a jar and then poured some water in it, I still have hide glue, it's going to work great. I just don't know what the weights are. And so I don't know how much I'm adding or taking away. So salt or urea, if I kick it up to, um, oh, this is 30%. Oh, yeah, so I, I, I made a mental error. The 30% the is, is the amount of salt you need to, um, to turn this into hide glue. Now, it's liquid hide glue. So if you go on a lot of websites about liquid hide glue, you're going to see invariably um, a statement that said, add 5 to 15% salt to make liquid hide glue. If you go on popular woodworking, it said, add 50% um, salt to make hide glue, to liquid hide glue. Well, if you go on all these websites, particularly the ones that are saying 5 to 15%, it's like one guy said it sometime and another guy copied it. And because two guys were saying it, it must be true. And it's all over the place, and it is absolutely not true. You cannot get liquid hide glue 
by adding 15%. And they're all silent on whether it's by weight or by volume. So when I tried to figure this thing out, um, Don Williams published a, a, an article saying that, and Don Williams was a conservator in, in Williamsburg, uh, very respected guy in the industry. He makes his liquid hide glue by adding 50% salt by weight. That is a boatload of salt. It will, it will precipitate out. So somewhere between 15, which I know does not make liquid hide glue, and 50 is the saturation point for salt in hide glue. So Don Williams will always have liquid hide glue. He will also always have a residue of salt at the bottom of the jar. Okay? which doesn't hurt anything, but you know, it, it, it avoids you having to weigh a lot of stuff. Um, so what I did to figure it out was I simply took some hide glue in a standard batch. I added 5% by weight of salt. I cooked it. I waited to the next day and tried to make it liquid and not so much. 10%, right? 15%, 20 When I hit 30%, 25% it started to kind of act like liquid hide glue. At 30% it did act like liquid hide glue. So uh, my point is empirically 192 gram strength using that particular hide glue 30% salt. If you get it from a different manufacturer or you're using a different gram strength, you'll have to do a little experimenting and figure it out. But once you figure it out, it's, you've got the number. So if you look at this, this is liquid hide glue, and you're going to say to yourself, that doesn't look very liquid to me. And if you, if you buy, if you buy um, um, old, old brown glue, uh, it's pretty viscous uh, at room temperature, so you need to put it in a warm bath. And it's, once, once it gets warmed up, it's liquid and it stays liquid for quite a while. Um, my glue, that mixture, is, is even more viscous than Patrick Edwards, but I put that in hot water, and once it gets liquid, it stays liquid all day long. Um, so I, that's the mixture I prefer. I don't get a lot of salt precipitating out when I make it, um, and um, it's as good as, and you, so the amount of effort to make the liquid hide glue, if you're set up with hide glue at all in the first place, is, is trivia. So uh, vinegar will improve adhesion. So if you're doing hammer veneering and you want to get your you know, the, the thing done, uh, you want the, the veneer to grab, you can add a little vinegar. Um, and glycerin uh, makes the glue a little more flexible. So it will creep, but it will keep it flexible. And I use it for um, the back of timbers and things like that. Any special kind of salt, rock salt, table salt? Table salt. salt. Table salt. But it, it it's by weight. so. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter. Um, so liquid hide glue is formulated to stay liquid at room temperature, and it's been around for a really long time. Um, I experimented with it, and I was able to get glue joints that held together the next day with a 30-minute open time. So the strength of liquid hide glue, there's a study, the uh, properties of commercial liquid hide glue and, transi and transitional hot hide glue in response to changes in relative humidity and temperature by Susan Brock of the Delaware Winterfer Program of Art Conservation. This person is not a blogger. Uh, and they say that the factor affecting strength on this is the humidity and the environmental conditions and not the glue. So if you want to engage in the argument that liquid hide glue is weaker than something else, you got to pass by two things. You got to call up Susan and explain to her why her PhD paper was garbage. <laughs> and you also have to explain to the people why it matters if something is stronger than the wood itself, whether I think it's stronger or weaker than something else which is just strong, stronger than the wood itself. So I don't get it. <clears throat> the conclusion I came to after I did this was bloggers make stuff up and other bloggers repeat it. So be careful. There was a study that 
Time with working to probably 15 or 20 years ago testing uh, high glue against TVAs and uh, epoxies and three or four other types of glues for sorts and all. Uh, and for ultimate tensile strength, high glue is the highest. Yeah. A lot of it has to do with whether you're dealing with, dealing with compression or, or shear. Um, and whether you've used 192 or 251, because the higher it gets, the shear becomes more of a problem. Uh, I read all those things, and they all are strong. The, all the glues are stronger than the wood itself. So I don't get the whole argument at all. So, all right. So uh, these are the formulas. Um, This is the important one up here. Wherever this is going. So this, these are ratios. So if you don't like my 50 grams, 80 grams of water, 15 grams of salt, if you don't like that, these are the ratios up here that you would use. So whatever weight of glue you use, that becomes 10. So if you had 20 pounds of glue, you would need um, 16 divided by 10 pounds of, of uh, times, times uh, whatever the weight of glue was you put in there. You, you know how to do ratios. So, um, so I settled on this of 50 grams of glue to 80 grams of water. And this, you know, it's interesting. I used that for years, and when I got this bag of glue from Bjorn Industries, and I, I've used their stuff for years. All of a sudden, it was too thick. So now I'm using 85 grams of water. So when you get a batch of high glue, you want to want to put it through its paces, if you care. If, you, if you're just mixing high glue, you just add a bunch of water and adjust it to the consistency you like. <coughs> so it's uh, 80, 50, and 15 makes liquid high glue, and this is something that converts uh, tablespoons to grams <coughs> um, if you prefer using volumes, but I don't, so. Have you used urea? Yes. Any difference? Um, the urea, you know how, how viscous that, that sample was? Mm -hmm. The urea is less viscous, and that's the only difference. Um, So this is, you can get this on Amazon. Um, but table salt is ubiquitous. I mean, I just go upstairs and grab some and, <coughs> and put it in the shop. What is urea? Urea, I don't know. Organic nitrogen. They use, all this stuff, if you go back to the 18th century, all these things are farm products. You know, so they were around and they used them. Um, I bought it because I was curious as to what the big difference was, and there really wasn't any other than um, it was slightly less viscous. I could just get there by adding a little more salt. Yes? Do you ever, you, do you ever heat your joints before you glue them with high glue? Tape them? Heat them. Heat with them. With a heat gun? Or, it, um, it, dep fire. it depends on how cold the shop is. Okay. But so. I'll get to that when we're doing some of the hammer veneering because I, I have actually gotten a heating pad and laid it on my substrate because the shop was so cold and I needed some open time and I didn't want to add salt to a hammer, hammer veneering job. So, yeah. um, but so, so the answer is yes, I have used a heat gun, but you, you probably don't need it yeah. most of the time. So these are the things that we would do today with it. Furniture joints, rub joints, wood filler, grain filler, hammer veneering, press veneering, timbers, and biscuit joinery. And these are the things I actively use this stuff for. Um, a rub joint. So this is my glue pot. Um, when I bought it, it was $9. It's now not $9. It's probably $15. Um, 
this is the glue I cooked yesterday and my glue brush my glue brush is a china bris bristle brush where I've cut off about half the bristles because I wanted a little bit stiff mm -hmm. so you can buy a very expensive horsehair glue brush because that's what they used in the 18th century because they had horses um, it's easier to get this bristle and one of the problems with a brush like this is the bristles can come out but after you use it for hide glue a little the hide glue gets in here and these bristles don't come out anymore <laughs> so um, so a rub joint is a very uses a gel a gel point So I've got these boards. Uh, they're just two pieces of pine, crappy pine, and I jointed them last night. And these can be as long as you want. Um, this is how I glue up my tabletops. So you just put something in there, take some hide glue, brush it on. And you, you slide these two together, and try to keep them aligned, and you can feel as you're going, as the temperature starts to drop, it starts to get harder and harder to move. And then it's going to grab, and then you walk away. And that's it. Your joint is now rubbed. And this, one of the attributes of hide glue is it shrinks as it dries. Um, so that joint is going to get tighter um, overnight. Um, some of the areas where this is handy, as I said, I use this for, um, we're going to let this just gel for a few minutes and then I'll pass it around. Um, what you would normally do with that is simply take it, lean it up against the wall, and go to work. So some of the areas where a rub joint is really handy today is places where it's very hard to get a clamp. And one of the places that's notoriously hard for, to get a clamp that people work on are these knee blocks. So if you just put some hide glue on the joint and on the leg and just rub it back and forth until it gels, walk away. Your, your joint is joined. These little corner blocks that go in here um, to hold these, these bracket feet together, great, great place for a rub joint. Um, you want to be able to get both sides glued at the same time. You don't want to, you know, 14 clamps sitting in there. And you saw how long it took. So thinking about stuff like this um, and what you can do functionally may want to increase your interest in buying a little glue pot like that and keeping some glue around your workshop. What's the clean up on it? You just hit it with a little bit of sandpaper and you're done? Clean, clean up on what? A, a clean up on the glue joint. Like PVA is a pain in the neck. you got to scrape it. They're, they're, you got to make sure that it doesn't seep into the wood. You're just saying you just hit it with some sandpaper. and. But, um, because if you were to put a finish over that, there was glue all over the place, squeeze it out of the wood. Well, what I would do with this is I would let it sit for another 50, looks like I didn't make a very good glue joint here. Um, you can feel this. It's, yeah, it's a little sticky. Yeah, so I would just scrape that off, let it dry, and then I would use a scraper on it later on. But even if it ran down here like this, um, I'm going to do this joint again. Oh, I didn't join this board correct. It's, it's joined perfectly fine in the back. It's, it's open in the front, so I, it's a yep. crappy planing job. But that's um, cleaning up after hide glue is, it's really not an issue. Um, I scrape, uh, I'll pull a plane, uh, not a plane, uh, uh, um, a chisel across that just to get the, the beaded glue off. What you don't want to do 
is leave that beaded glue with hide glue on there and let it dry completely because you will rip out the wood when you go to get that glue off. It is very, very hard. So you really want to, if you've got any real um, glue that's sticking out of your joint, it's best to get it off before it sets up. Not because it's going to screw up your finish, it's going to be really, really hard to get off. Okay, wood filler. This is pretty obvious. You just take some sawdust. I make my sawdust by using a dull scraper. Um, and dull scrapers are very easy to come by. <laughs> um, um, and I just make a bunch of dust using a scraper. And I do that because I don't want all the grits of silicon or whatever aluminum oxide in the, in the stuff I'm going to put in my furniture project. So um, I make some right at the beginning of a project. I'll take some cutoffs make a whole bunch of, of um, filler and I'll put it in a jar and use it and you just take a little tiny you know some like a one ounce paper thingy you get them the kind they put ketchup in in, in McDonald's or something you throw a little hide glue in there you throw your your um, your sawdust in there put it in your in your pot brush it on and you've got filler the issue with this is you, you, you might want to experiment a little bit um, because the, if you think about it, this dust you're making or this fill you're making is all end grain. <clears throat> so when you put the high glue on it, it really gets dark. So you could experiment a little with different species to back off the color a little bit if you're trying to do a color match. <clears throat> One of the things that I found as in, if you're trying to fill a real serious hole, I had a really nice piece of mahogany that I, somebody gave me, and I had, somebody drilled a hole in it, you know, and I didn't want to have to cut away the hole because it was a really nice piece of mahogany. So one of the things that hide glue lets you do, you probably could do this with PVA glue, but it's a lot easier with hide glue, is if you take a, a V chisel, and you kind of carve out just with one scoop uh, through that, through, through, over that um, drill hole. Then you go to a separate piece of the board and do it again and take the piece you just carved out and put some hide glue down on that spot and um, um, put some hide glue down and then put the piece you just carved out of the other piece of the board and you take a piece of um, Take a piece of melamine or anything, wood with wax paper, and you just put it down on top of that and clamp it down for 15 minutes and then scrape it. You'll never see, never see that. Um, and if you tried to fill that hole, you, it will always look like a circle was filled with something. It's, it's just impossible to get rid of it. So sometimes creating a bigger hole is the solution and the hide glue is good because it's not going to affect the finish and it sets up pretty quickly. Okay, hammer veneering. Um, we're going to do a table, but everything I've showed you is a flat surface. This, this is a <coughs> little card table. And the interesting thing about this is it's got a curved front. And it is absolutely no different. Hammer veneering, a serpentine front, or a curved front, or a concave front, or a convex front than it is to hammer a flat front. It, it just doesn't make any difference. It makes a huge difference if you're trying to do this in a press or a vacuum press. It's, veneering curved surfaces can be tedious. <clears throat> so um, if you were going to make a table like this, I would tell you definitely that's the time to learn to use hide glue because all the time you were going to invest in trying to make your forms and all that to vacuum press this thing goes away. <clears throat> so a lot of veneers come crinkly um, and very stubborn and if you tried to hammer them you would break them and they would shatter, particularly burls. Burls and crotches um, are notorious for that. <clears throat> so I use a uh, veneer softener 
Uh, again, I make my own mainly because it's easier and way cheaper than buying it. Uh, it's, this is a formula that Phil Lowe used. It's the water, alcohol, glycerin, and a little bit of hide glue. And I rarely put the hide glue in it. <clears throat> when you think about what this is doing, you put water on veneer, and if it's not too crinkly, if it's just kind of, you need to smooth it out to, uh, to, to water is all you need. Just put the water on it and iron it with a household iron. It'll be fine. <clears throat> the alcohol, what that's doing is it's dragging the water into the pores a little faster. So it's, it's getting more penetration from the water into the veneer. <clears throat> In today's veneers that are a 40th of an inch thick, uh, you know, the glycerin is keeping it pliable. So if you had a very uh, brittle board, uh, like crotch mahogany, and you just put the water and the alcohol on it, and you pressed it down through boards and papers and stuff, and you kept it between the boards, when you took it out, it will be flat, but it will also be brittle, because it just went back to the way it used to be. You know, it's, it's the same properties. So the glycerin permeates the, the wood, and it, it gives it a pliability that um, will last longer. Um, the hide glue, the theory between the about the hide glue, or most other um, websites almost invariably say some god-awful amount of PVA glue. And the theory behind that is when you flatten it out, you want the glue in there that's going to keep it in that shape so that when you use it sometime in the future, it's the shape that you made it. Um, I, I, I could never bring myself to add any amount of PVA glue to something I know I'm going to put a finish on. I, I know that people do it all the time. I just can't bring myself to do it. And the second part is I do this softening when I need it. Uh, I don't do it weeks or months ahead of time. I do, I'm, if I know I'm going to flatten, I'm, if I know I'm going to hammer veneer a top the day after tomorrow, I'll start flattening it today. Um, by tomorrow, it, it's just drying, and even if it's a little moist when I'm, when I'm hammering it down, I'm going to wet it anyway. So, you know, this, this whole thing of, you know, keep putting endless amounts of newsprint on it until it's completely dry. If, if you're going to put it on a shelf and you're not going to use it for months, that's, it'll dry out, but it's also going to start to curl up unless you keep it pressed again. So, I use the water, the alcohol, and the glycerin. Uh, on things that um, are brittle. On things that are not brittle, I don't bother with the glycerin and I probably won't bother with the alcohol. And I'll do it at the time when I need it, not at some time in the future. But again, these are all practical decisions that you make in your own shop. If you like having a lot of boards, you know, holding together pieces of veneer, have at it. Um, I recently worked on a table with uh, an extraordinarily uh, brittle piece of um, uh, olive wood uh, veneer. Um, it was a bear to flatten because it was so brittle that we basically had to soak it with this formula and put it in a plastic bag overnight to let it absorb because just putting a, you know, a piece of MDF on top of it, you could hear it cracking. So the next day it was soft enough so that we could put, just laid, laid one of these on it and just let it ease itself down. And four hours later, we added a little bit of weight, a little bit more moisture and a little bit more weight and a little bit more moisture until we got it flat. But it was really brutally brittle, uh, but it came out really nice. So <clears throat> when it came out from, uh, from between the presses, it went on to the substrate and got hammer veneered down right away because it was if I had left that an hour, it was going right back where it, it, God wanted it to be. It was because... Anyway. Okay, so there are two ways to go about hammer veneering. Um, one way is, you, you see a lot of people, they put hide glue on the top, on the face surface and on the bottom, and they hammer veneer it, and as they're hammer veneering it, they're the, the, the hammer is taking away the glue that was on the top. <clears throat> the second way of doing it is to put water on the top and glue on 
where, where it's going on the substrate and um, hammering it that way. Is that a lubricant so that the hammer doesn't bite yeah. you? Yes, um, it, you, you need a lubricant, but the, the, what makes the difference between these two is really the finish that you're looking for and how confident you are that you can get this thing down without requiring more heat. So if you've got a, a board you're going to veneer and you're trying to book match, you know, two pieces of, of crotch or swirl or something, <clears throat> and you put glue on both sides, if, if you did not get that glue, that, that top veneer down completely, and it did not gel, completely or it gelled too soon and you've got kind of a thick layer of glue on the part of it and you put glue on the top of it there isn't much you're going to be able to do about that unless you scrape the top and then reheat it up to reactivate the glue and then um, work on it if you if you didn't put glue on the top and you're using water <clears throat> you can use an iron throughout the process and make sure everything is down the way you want it to be and that's the method I'm going to demonstrate today um, but we can also try the, the one with the, um, uh, with the glue. Now, one of the reasons using the glue on the top is, one of the real benefits is, it's a spectacular grain filler. So if you've got mahogany uh, or any other open grain wood and you use the glue on the top, you don't have to worry about using 400 coats of shellac or whatever to fill that grain. It, it's going to be filled right from the glue. But you can also apply the hide glue later on um, as, a, as a grain filler, and we'll talk about that today too. It's a little more risky. If you're putting grain filler down on solid wood, there pretty much isn't anything you're going to do to screw that up. <clears throat> if you're doing it on something you veneered, there are two things you need to remove a piece of veneer that's been hammer veneered down. Moisture and heat. And if you take the hide glue um, filler, it is almost all water and it is hot. So you could, unless you're very judicious about how you do this, wind up lifting the veneer you just put down. Okay, so. Um, jointing veneers. There are two ways to joint them. And we're going to demonstrate both of these. One is to overlap the veneers and then cut down the middle. And the other one is to butt joint the two veneers. And we'll talk about when we're doing it, why you would pick one over the other and where you would pick them. Okay. Um, preparing the veneers. Uh, you make the substrate. Uh, this is my method. It is very hard to deal with if, if a, if a, piece of veneer is going to fail somewhere as, from hammer veneering, it's going to fail on the edge. So if you are trying to hammer veneer right to the edge, the next day it, don't be surprised if a piece of that is sticking up. Okay. So I make my substrates oversized. I never run the veneer out to the edge and I cut them down to size after everything is dried up and glued down. Um, all the pieces are marked um, ahead of time for chatoyance. Um, the overlap is glued down. The butt joint is prepared with the veneers dry. Um, the, so the overlap joint is done while you're hammer veneering. The butt joint needs to be done before you're hammer veneering. And um, there are basically two ways to go about it. You can use a knife or a saw to cut through and get a straight edge, or you can shoot them on a plane. And I prefer shooting them on a plane. Um, I, I, I cut them with a knife, but I found I get better results with just a couple of passes of a plane, particularly on things like um, those swirls or a crotch or something like that where, the, where the, um, the grain is going in all sorts of nasty directions. Okay, so to tooth or not to tooth. There's a lot of discussion about whether you need the tooth to veneer. Um, the, the, when, you, when you 
talk about two things. You hear people say things like it improves the grip, it improves the glue surface, and period, uh, furniture makers toothed it, so we should tooth it. Um, I spent a fair amount of time looking into this. So but this is in the category of I'm probably more of a blogger for this discussion than anything else, so take it with a grain of salt, okay? The fact is that period furniture makers tooth everything. If you look at the underside of a table, it's toothed. The, uh, the backside of an apron, it's toothed because they use the toothing plane as the first leveling process in their planing process. Do you know what toothing is? Oh, um, I don't know if you can see it from there, but these planes have little slots cut in them. Um. So it creates a, 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 like a sawtooth pattern. Um. And if you go over the surface, it'll create that sawtooth pattern. How oh, just like little grooves? Yeah, little, yeah. Um, So where was I? Ah, so they toothed everything. And they toothed their veneers because they sawed their veneers. So they needed to get, and they toothed the side that they would tooth is not the top, but the part they were going to put down because they needed it to be flat. So this theory that it improves, um, you know, the gluing action, it, hide glue is a chemical reaction, not a mechanical reaction. It's, there's, of course, some mechanical behavior in there, but it's been... By far, most of it is chemical reaction. It's not going to be improved. Its grab won't be into, improved by toothing. So um, I don't think that it's necessary, unless you're trying to flatten veneers and unless you're sawing your own, <coughs> toothing is not going to do much for you. In fact, we're going to use MDF today, and I'm not going to tooth it, and there's nothing flatter than MDF. So <coughs> what will happen if you tooth it um, is the, the, the veneer won't slide around too much, but it, as you're going to see in the demonstration, that really doesn't matter, okay? Um, oops. Um, so I have a toothing plane. I use it when I want to plane a, a surface like tiger, tiger maple. I'll tooth it. And then I'll take a number seven very finely set plane and just, when you just get past that toothing surface, you've got a pristine. And I got into this when, by going to Williamsburg and I was looking at this massive chest of drawers that was tiger maple and it was an absolutely pristine surface and it was done in like 1780 or something like that. And I, I just had to find out how the hell you know, they don't have these belt sanders and all that. How did these guys do this thing? And that's, that's when I got into this toothing plane business. All right. Okay, so we're ready to do a demo. Uh, is this a good time to take a break? Yeah. The restroom, plenty of coffee here. Okay, so we're actually going to do some woodworking instead of talk about it. Uh, I wanted to show you the setup that I use. Um, you can you you can buy a um, a regular commercial um, hide glue pot. Um, they're they're great. They, they cost about 140 bucks. I don't even know if they're still making them, but um, uh, they are. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they have a solid. They, they have fixed for a fixed temperature and whatnot. This is a uh, a little variable temperature teapot you get on Amazon. They're probably in the $15, $20 range now. Um, and if you play with it long enough, uh, you can find the setting that'll keep this glue at 140 degrees. So the way this is set up is uh, this comes with a, a white top. You throw it away. You get a piece of plexiglass or anything that is not going to absorb water cut a hole in it for these jars. These jars are unique. They're bone something jam. Uh, and the thing that makes them really useful for hide glue is they're right about the right size and they have a lip around here. So if you cut the right size hole, this will slip down and stay in a certain spot. 
But if you want to be true to the period of 1800s, you have to buy the raspberry because they believe that the raspberry jam was just the right mixture with the hide glue to, to make. So don't buy the strawberry, buy the this raspberry. Is no, this, this is bone, bone the pit, this, it's in the slides. There's, I have not found any other jar that does this. And you can tell I have a real appetite for raspberry jam because I have a lot of these jars. <laughs> They're really jam jars. That they have this, you want this to be able to come in and out and you don't want it to fall through. So having that little ridge around the top is, is, couldn't be better. Um, so you make this plastic oversize. In the beginning I was just putting the jar in the water but the heat plate on the bottom gets really intense, so the glue was getting cooked at a much higher temperature than 140 at the bottom and not so much at the top. And you, without this piece of plastic at the top, it was almost impossible to keep a small amount of water like this at a constant temperature. And this water is probably more like 160 degrees to keep the glue at 140 degrees. And I have a piece of plastic that I cover the top with when I'm not using the glue or else the top will skin over and, and whatnot. Uh, and again, I'm going to get rid of this. We don't need this right now. Okay. So if you don't want to go that route, this is exactly the same setup. It's just a hot plate, a pot, a piece of wood with a hole in it, and the same jar and you just find the right temperature on that um, and that, that's this is all you need for I, I, this is what I've been using for forever a, I have a mini crock pot with candy thermometer exactly <laughs> but the, the important thing is the hide glue is completely unaware of what pot it was sitting in it, it's very aware of what temperature it is but that's about it so I'm going to move this away Okay, so the other tools that are used is a, what's called a veneer hammer. Most of them are shop made, you can buy commercial ones. The traditional, or the ones that are referred to as traditional have a brass insert in here. Mine is high density molecular weight plastic. Um, it works, in my opinion, better than brass. It's easily shaped with hand tools and it has the unique property of hide glue doesn't stick to it. Uh, and hide glue sticks to just about anything. So these are great. But you don't really need an insert. I, I made this one years ago and it was just too wide for the way I want it to work. I took the, the measurements out of some book and um, I'm sure that whoever learned to hide glue with this originally liked it because that's how we learned it. I learned on one that was more like this. So um, to make it, you just, it's a slab of wood Cut, cut a slot in it, stick something in it, whatever you like, brass, um, high density molecular weight plastic, or nothing at all, okay? Um, this is the one I started with. It's a piece of South American something rose. They make it up, you know, it's lumber liquidators, can't cut this with a saw, can't plane it, can't do anything with it, it's kind of wood. I stuck a handle on it and I even left the little floor tab on it and I used this for about 10 years and it works fine. Um, when you're done with it, you just wipe it off with some warm water and that's it. And if you really got something nasty going on here, just take a hand plane and run it across it and it's fine. So you don't need, um, you need I don't need to go out and buy a hammer. There, this is another I couldn't find my original one, so I made one last night. The, um, this is a hammer veneer without a handle. And since most people use it like this and not like this, um, you really only need this and you can hammer with it. So if you really want to go with the I don't want to spend any money on this at all, 
you just need something with a flat edge that's rounded over a little bit and it's going to work fine. In fact, you could make these disposable and sell them for $79.95. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Why they call it hammering and a squeegee? I have no idea. Yeah. It's it's really a squeegee. Yeah. So maybe they didn't have squeegees and how to call it something else. If you go to a fiberglass supply place, you can buy a bunch of red plastic squeegees, really cheap. Oh, they yeah. work great. Right? Yeah. Because again, nothing sticks to them. Yeah. yeah. The, the idea is to get enough weight on the veneer to be able to push the liquid glue out from underneath it to get a very, you know, almost a vacuum press surface underneath it. You don't want to leave a lot of glue. So anything that does that is going to work. The glue is completely unaware of what you're using. Um, so that's how you hammer it down. And I have one of these, which is basically a little hammer. And I use this for stringing and cross banding because you can use this, but it just gets a little unwieldy. Um, so these are my hammers. You got a veneer saw, um, which are handy to have. Uh, they need to be tuned up. You can't really use them the way they come in the, you know, when you buy them. You need to file these to a point, and um, you can refile these edges as long as you like. But uh, there are lots of videos um, on how to tune up one of these things, but you really should, if you're going to use one, tune it up before you use it. Um, now, this one is a little unique. Um, this is mine, and I use this a lot. And as you look, it's a carpet knife. But it's a carpet knife that's been modified. So, um, this is used to cut veneer. So it, you can use it to cut across, or you can use it to cut with. I use this when I'm hammer veneering on the veneer that's wet, because it will cut through it very easily. To make one of these, you simply get a decent carpet knife. This one was about 50 years old when it started, and it was all rusty. And you grind off the edge. You want to grind it past. It's a these things are double beveled. There's a bevel on this side, there's a bevel on that side. So you want to grind it past the bevels, just on the edge. The, the business side of this is just this front eighth of an inch. Okay? So you grind it and then flatten this side. And then just on a stone, going like this, put an edge on this side. And this will work better than any knife you have in your shop for doing veneering because it has the attribute of having this, this height over here. So if you put it against something and you hold it, you've got a registration surface. And since this side is ground flat, you're not getting any bevel. So whatever is under here, this, the keep side is here, and it will have a square edge on it. OK? Um, so we can pass this around. Somebody. It's sharp, be careful. So this isn't. I, I would have thought it was a roofer's knife for cutting asphalt shingles. Um, I guess. I mean, I, I think it's a carpet knife, but what if it's a roofer's knife? I don't really care. It's. Um, this is another shop made tool. Uh, where I told you, I showed you some demonstrate some pictures of uh, draw fronts where we had miters cut in them. So the, the way those miters are made is that the two sides are overlapped. You just take a, a long knife. You could use a Stanley knife for this. Put it on the miter and tap it with a hammer and pull out the pieces and you got a miter. So I just, since I was doing it so often, this is a piece of uh, paint scraper from Lowe's, just by a scraper blade. Stick it in a piece of wood and I sharpen these things a little bit more than they come as paint scrapers, um, but uh, they work fine. So that's the whole kit. Um, 
that's that's hammer veneer, the toolkit for hammer veneering plus a little hide glue. So if you're already using hide glue for other stuff, that's all you need. And except for this, everything is shop made. Okay. All right. So let's talk about preparing uh, veneers. This is a substrate we're going to use today. And I already laid it out. So we're going to have a center field of something. We're going to book match some cherry. Okay. And then we're going to put some holly stringing around that. And then we're going to put some cross banding around that. And that so this could be any size table. It could be, you could make it into a coffee cup holder or you could make it into a kitchen table. It doesn't matter. This, this process works regardless of size. The, the veneer bag size doesn't count, okay? All right, so before you start this, you have to lay it out and you want to prepare your materials. And the first, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna veneer the back because what you, when you veneer one side, you should veneer the other side. So you want to cut up enough veneers so that you can overlap them. And this is just some poplar. So we can get these laid down. Uh, and we're going to do that here in a, in a minute. Is that really necessary with MDF? Uh, I've had stuff curl on me. Uh, but MDF. but that, that being said, and I haven't tried this. I have a very respected author who learned in a shop in England who claims that if you veneer one side and you lay it down on newsprint, it won't curve. I haven't tried it. But when I'm making a top like this, this top's going to be around a really long time and it might not I can't convince myself it's never going to curve. Uh, I haven't had MDF curve, and I don't, I don't bother about draw fronts. They're only like four inches high. Uh, I, I ask because I've never, I've never done veneering with MDF. Yeah, I treat it like anything else. You know, um, the, the only difference with MDF is if I'm going to put edging on it, I will size the edges with hide glue um, and let it soak in because um, the, the as you know, MDF really can be very absorbent. And, you know, you can wind up getting swelled edges if you're not careful. So I need, an, I need to cut pieces. And I make, so this, this top is a half an inch too big uh, all around. Because I'm going to do all this and then I'm going to cut it to size. So I accounted for that. These pieces, as you can see, are smaller than the substrate, but larger than the amount that I'm going to cut off when I do it. So um, we'll get to that. Then I'm going to need stringing. And this is the part that creates issues for a lot of people. So making these little stringing guys, if, if, if your center field is going to be this veneer, then you need stringing that is exactly that thickness. So if this is a 42nd of an inch, this needs to be a 42nd of an inch. And when you're doing solid stringings, you take a piece of holly, you cut it up, and you put it, pull it through a little thicknesser, and you make it any size you want. When you're doing hammer veneering, you need to, the important part is getting this height uh, correct. So how do, you, how do you go about doing that? How do you, how do you cut a consistent uh, thickness? Because this thing has to be consistent on, along its length, particularly when you're dealing with um, holly veneers that are pretty suspect these days. I mean, you look at the grain, if it was quarter sawn, you'd say, okay, fine. But this, this is flat sawn. It's got all sorts of cathedrals on it. Uh, a knife is going to wander. You, you really can't use a veneer saw. But you also need to come up, since this, this holly, 
since this holly is going to be butted against the center field, like so, and then is going to be butted against cross banding, like so, if you can get this holly to be square on both sides, it's a benefit. Quite frankly, with the amount of water and glue and movement and all that stuff, it's probably not a big deal. But where, where I can, for things that, that you know, you got this, the rule of sixes. You know, you got things that you look at from six yards, six feet, six inches. For some reason, these furniture embellishments, these holly things, get these six, six millimeter rule. I mean, the first thing that happens, people, you know, they're, they're really down in there. So the more you can do to, to deal with your fellow woodworkers, most human beings, it doesn't matter. The woodworkers, it matters, so. Okay, so the method I use for making stringing So the first thing you have to do is start off with a straight edge to start off with. And you can do that by simply laying down um, Now I'm just cutting off an arbitrary amount of holly. Okay, so th I theoretically have a straight edge. Now I want to cut a, f a fixed thickness off this thing, and in my case, I want to cut off 3 sixty-fourths of an inch, because I decided that's, that's the size stringing I want. I could have made it a sixteenth of an inch, I could have made it less than that. But for these tops, that's a good thickness for me. So what we want to wind up with is I want to be able to cut off in here, um, but I, uh, uh, this, this, I want to be able to cut this thing off so that my, this is my keep side and this is my waist side because I want a flat edge over here. So I cut a little channel in a piece of MDF that is deep, deeper than the thickness of the veneer. Um, and set back the width that I'm looking for to cut, to cut off, okay? So I just simply put this down, I slide this under, rub it back and forth to get it where I, wa to get where I want it. And then I have a little sandpaper on this thing here. So I bring this up to this, and then I turn this over. Now you can look, if you want to come up here, you can see that I've got this, uh, you know, consistent thickness all the way up and down. And that if I could put a straight edge against this and cut it, I'm going to get that thickness from out underneath it. So you put this on it, take this away. Ah. Well, that ain't going to work. I just need it straight. Oh, straight. It doesn't need to be square, it just needs to be straight. I'm going to throw away the ends anyway. Now, if I had any sense, I would put sandpaper on the back of this piece too. But.
so I have my and it, you know you just you're not making a lot of these so it's a 10 minute operation to make a lot anybody want to try that I just so you you um, keep side is over here slide this under slide it back and forth to make sure you got a first surface slide this up turn this over Piece of piece of stringing, okay? Yeah, there's a groove in this. Oh, okay, you slide. It yeah, you can pass it around. Way. So you're sliding that under till it hits this. That's how you know. Yeah. Okay. okay, so the next thing we have to prepare is cross banding. Now cross banding can be interesting because it has, you're looking for something normally with a pretty strong grain pattern like this. But when you have a strong grain pattern like that, these pieces want to break, okay? But for cross banding, it really doesn't matter. What does matter is chatoyance. So I have marked I got mark it somewhere. There it is. I have this chalk mark. So all of these pieces have a chalk mark that when I cut it off was on this end of the wood. So that when I put these down on the board, whether I put this chalk mark, towards, chalk mark towards the middle or I put it to the outside, as long as I'm consistent, the chatoyance going around it is going to be consistent. Okay? And the chalk comes off pretty easily with all the water and everything that's flowing. So the method for cutting this is exactly the same method. Um, this one doesn't matter as much because you really only need one square edge because the other one's getting cut off. Um, so, same method. In this case, I have a piece of wood that is set back an inch and an eighth. Okay. So I simply slide this up against it. And I have my piece of cross banding. And you can see this is breaking. And it does, it's not going to matter. Okay? Um, so a word that I wasn't familiar with, chatoyance. Is yeah. that just like the way the ray flexor projecting? When you, particularly with mahogany, if you, if you look at it from this direction after it's finished, and then you look at it from this direction after it's finished, it looks different. It's, it's like a, a good oriental rug, depending on which side of the room you're standing on, it looks different. So if you took this, this stuff, the, the edge, uh, the cross banding, and you put one one way, and then the one next to it is the other way, and the one next to it the other, you know, it would... You might see it, you might not see it. You get dark and light. Exactly, so, but, you know, Okay, so let us begin.
All right, so the first thing we're going to do is lay the veneer down on the back and we're going to use an overlap joint and cut it uh, overlapped. Um, and this is the method that Tay Frid was talking about when he said I could veneer the world because you can just keep going. Sleep yep, exactly. Just keep going. Okay. All right, so I'm going to lay this one down. I'm going to start somewhere around there. And I'm not going to put glue. I'm not going to put glue on both surfaces. I'm going to put water on the top of this. And we're just going to put glue on the substrate. So we're just going to slop some glue down here. Yes. Okay. Um Can this be plugged in? Yeah. All right, so this is down. Now this glue, I could, I could see it. Um, I could see it um, gelling as it went down. Um, so that's one I would probably want to put the iron over and make sure and reactivate the glue. So we're going to do the second piece. Do we like it like this or do we like it like this? I like it like this. All right, so we're just going to measure this one over. I want to make sure I get an overlap on it. And all I'm doing here is marking roughly where I want the glue to stop. You want to be able to, you don't want this iron hot, you want it warm. So if you, if you can't keep your hand on it, it's too hot. And if you put it down and it goes <laughs> probably too hot. Okay, <laughs> okay so um, we know we've got an overlap here. So I'm just going to put a straight edge down here. And I'm going to cut through both pieces. And you can feel it w once you're through the veneers. Where's my little, oh. So this piece goes away. And this piece gets lifted up. So this is setting already. So I'm just going to take this iron 
And this is why you, you don't want to put glue on the top because you couldn't do that if you had glue on it. Okay, and then you lift this piece up. So the iron just helps you extend the glue time? Uh, it reactivates the glue. Oh, I screwed this up. I didn't cut through. In any event, it'll look great up here. It'll look crappy down here. So this glue is gelled, but if anything was going on down here that I didn't like, I could simply... And the only thing you can do wrong with this iron, well, two things, make it too hot or stop. You never want to, you got to keep it moving. So if you look, I put that glue on and you can see glue coming out. The other thing you can do wrong is get caught using your wife's iron. <laughs> yeah, that's... Okay, so... Aside from the part that it didn't cut through this so it broke, if you come up here you can look at this joint and you can see that it is, um, and if you, after this sets up, you scrape it, you know, um, it's, it's for all practical purposes invisible. So with this one, Cut this one off about here. How hard are you pushing with a hammer? Really hard down? Like as hard as you can? No. Uh, good, re, re, good force. You know, so. If you don't see glue squeezing out from underneath the veneer, it's not enough. Or the glue gelled. So if that glue gelled, If that glue gelled and you let it sit, the next day you're going to see bubbles. Um, if you squeeze way, way too hard or you don't get glue everywhere, the next day you're going to have a void. And we'll, we'll talk about how you deal with those. So this glue here, this glue here is already gelled. Now I could scrape that off, but it's really not necessary because um, when I put hot hide glue down on that, it's going to reactivate it, okay? So, now if you had real stuff, see this is curling already, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But when I, put, when I put the moisture on this side, it's going to lay down again, okay? It's also a good idea to do that, which I haven't been doing. Guessing once you cut the two pieces away, you're yeah. You're, you, I don't the, want them. The, the glue on the bottom is really what exactly is what it. It's, it's, yeah. I'll try not to screw this one up. Why do you do differently? Not just press harder there. Or is that what you're doing differently to avoid the? the I'm going to cut enough times. <laughs> Why don't you see a saw curve after you? Um, because there's so much moisture in the glue. And we're talking about, this is, this is ground at about a 10 degree angle, and it's over a 42nd of an inch in thickness. It's, you know, theoretically it's there, but that's so I was saying, while it's a good idea to try to get both sides of that stringing square, it's a little bit anal, you know. The other thing is the saw, that saw doesn't have any set. Doesn't have any what? Set. Teeth aren't that outward on both sides. No. They're they're shaped like this. 
You see the glue squeezing out. Mm -hmm. The reason I knew it was there was this was sitting up. This is a good way to practice. Pardon me? It's a good way to learn how to do this, to practice on small pieces like this. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, you really don't work on much bigger than the pieces. Yeah, I mean, the pieces you do are really not that big to start off with. Yeah, but I hate to do a finished piece the first time. <laughs> So I didn't bring a scraper with me, and it's a little soon to be scraping, but that's basically how you get that down. And this glue is setting up. This, this, is, this piece was a train wreck. So this is sitting up. This swelled up. So it's sitting up. Can um, I feel it? Yeah. Can you reactivate it? Yeah. Now, you have choices at this point. Um, if you really believe there's a lot of glue under there, which there probably is, um, then you could reactivate it and hammer it, um, which we'll do. We'll see. Come on. Yeah, it's laying down now. But tomorrow, I would not be surprised if this is sticking up a little bit. And what I would do then, if I find that if you, if you try to wrestle these things to the ground while the glue is, you're in this glue, you, it's, it's just a circular argument. It's pretty much going to do what you want to do. So what I do is I have pieces of melamine that are different sizes. And I simply put the iron down on it. You know, so I would be, if I was doing this, I'd have this melamine, the hammer would be, the iron would be sitting on the melamine, because I want to get the melamine hot. So when the melamine gets hot, uh, you just take this, lay it on top, clamp it down, and 15 minutes later, this thing is below its gel point, and 99.9% .9 of the time, that is down and it's staying down, okay? Okay. I think this glue is too cold. This shouldn't be setting up this fast. Okay. So now, oh, having an old chisel that is not too sharp is handy because you want to get under things. And um, with all the water and glue and everything, it's not going to work. Okay, so let's do the center field. All right, so let's suppose this was... Uh, flame birch or, or mahogany crotch or something like that, and we're going to um, want to butt, you know, butt these two together. Because if we overlap them and cut them, while we will get a, um, a match if we cut down the middle, 
it's possible after all your fussing to get exactly the book match you want, it's, you're going to cut it away and it's, it's going to be like this or something. So in these cases, I prefer doing a butt joint. And to do a butt joint, you need to have two dead square edges. Um, and I normally do that with a hand plane and I, I'd like to demonstrate that. Um, but first we're going to cut these. So um, I'm just picking this as a place to go with this thing. And I've got this, so I'm going to go here, which is bigger than I want. And here, which is bigger than I want. Now, whether these edges are straight or not is irrelevant because I'm going to cut them away. So they don't have to be square, they don't have to be straight, they just have to be the right length. Now, my workbench has dog holes in it. So I'm able to take two pieces of, two pieces of MDF. I'm going to do this facing this way, just so you can see it. I don't know if I can. So my bench has dog holes in it and I use hold downs to do this. So we'll see if we can do it without hold downs. What a mess. Okay, so you take these two pieces. Thanks, thanks, I appreciate it. And you want to stick them out maybe an eighth of an inch. And you want to put another piece of MDF on top of it, and then I put hold downs to hold these two down here. So if two people can put their hands on that. Would a shooting board work just as well? Um, I guess if you had one long enough, but what you're trying to do, let me just reset this veneer a little bit. You want to keep this out far enough so the plane can get to it but um, close enough so that you don't get a lot of flex. Now what you want to do is you register the front of the plane, this front of the plane here, against the veneer, mm -hmm. and you're, all the weight is on this, and as you're going through, you shift, okay, it's important to let the plate out. <laughs> So you register against the front and you start to go through and, and then you switch the weight to the back. And when you're done, because I'm using such a long plane, you can see that the sole of the plane is against the veneer. So take a look down, you have to look down at it. So. Now, when you're doing that stringing I was talking about before, for some bizarre reason, after you do two or three of those things, the, the source piece develops a bow. So you need to shoot it to flatten it out again. I don't know why it does, but it does. Now, this thing looks flat, but all I know is that the top piece is flat because I didn't get any shavings or a full shaving. So I'm gonna register the front, come across, 
I'm going to let this blade out a little more. So you can hear it. And that sounds like I'm going against the grain, so I'm going to go this way. What am I hitting? Oh. So I'm not pushing this, I'm just holding it against the veneer and you can see the shavings that I'm getting, okay? And you want to do it until you get a full, a full shaving. Um, you can do it with any plane. The rule of thumb is you can flatten a piece of wood twice the length of your plane. But the benefit of using a long plane for this is the back side of it becomes a straight edge and you can, you can check. So if we look at this, here, take a look. That, that's, now you can do it with a saw, but you won't get an edge like that. Okay, so back to the, this is cold. All right. So we're gonna do a butt joint on this. No. Well, if one of these pieces were cracked uh, and I was afraid it was going to travel, I would put a piece of veneer tape on it. But you don't really need veneer tape with this. So why are you wetting the source board? Uh, it, it's really good practice because it lets the glue... Um, um, yeah. Some people actually size the, uh, size the uh, board before they do this. What? alteration or difference do you make if you are doing this with your own sawn veneers that it might be a sixteenth of an inch or an eighth of an inch thick? A lot more water or? Um, I, if I was doing it with that stuff, I might glue both sides. I mean, it's when you're getting up to a sixteenth of an inch, it's more like Oh, I gotta put. I gotta put this down. Huh? Oh, wrong side. Okay, so now I want to get this on this line, the center line. Where am I veneer? Oh. Now you could, you could theoretically um, veneer tape these together and try to hammer them down, but the, um, the way to get veneer tape off is to put hot water on it, so, you know. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's true. So you need to wet that side of the board? You know why? Because I'm not paying no, attention. Sure. No, no. <laughs> She's not, letting, she's not letting you forget. <laughs> you get into a rhythm when you're doing this, except when you got a lot of people staring at you, then, then you forget. Asking questions. What's that? Too many questions. No, the questions are great. You don't think about the questions, you don't think about the process. Okay, so we're going to slide this one up against this, and I'm going to kind of move the veneer hammer into that edge and you can see the glue coming out that's how I knew when I was doing the back I was in trouble because I, I turned the temperature up on this a little bit the glue was gelling too fast and uh, Does that crap matter? Does that, where? See how it's split? 
Um, it's not, if I can find the piece that I... It's very close. There was a piece of wood that dropped here. But it won't matter at all if I find that piece of wood. <laughs> or we can just, you know, treat it as a design opportunity and change the size of the cross bending. Yeah, this is longer. Yeah, this longer. What's that? Is this this is longer? You, you know, cross banding kind of come like. Yeah, this. yeah. So I can just make it a little. Yeah. How long until you can't iron iron? Does it come apart and it's permanent? No, that forever. You put hot water, and uh, and uh, an iron on this in in five years, and it'll come up. Oh. All right, let's all find that piece of wood here. It was anyway. I'm not going to waste a lot of time. No, no, no. But this happens a lot, particularly when you're sloppy like me. It breaks off. But if I had that piece, and I knew as soon as I saw it, I had to pay attention. Um, you would simply put some hide glue on that and slide it in, and you would never know. Okay. I don't see it. No, it's not worth talking about. Okay, so now this is down. I kind of want to wipe as much of the glue off the top as I can because I don't want to have to scrape it off tomorrow. And then I simply take a straight edge. And I try to do the cross grain piece first in case it breaks out. So while I'm doing this, give some thought to where you would be and what you would be doing if you were trying to prepare this for a vacuum bag and how you would be dealing with the stringing and all that other stuff, okay? When Phil Lowe used to do it, he used to coat the top with glue as well. Yes. Squeegee of that often was a real mess. Yeah, um, that is another way to do it, but you, you really lose the opportunity to use the iron when you do that. Oh, yeah. And to me, the iron is worth um, it's worth its weight in gold. There aren't a lot of things you can screw up that you can't fix. Um, like if I come tomorrow and there's a bubble in this, it's fixable. Um, okay, so there's our, our butt joint, okay, um, fairly invisible. Now, if you were doing um, a crotch or something like that, a significant part of this join would be end grain because the stuff goes all over the place. And the end grain is harder to hide. So that's the stuff where you re I could have shot this, I could have done this with a saw and gotten something very close to this. But with crotch and burl and stuff like that, shooting it with a really sharp plane will give you the best possible edge when you're doing a butt joint, okay? All right, so now we're gonna do the stringing. And I need my other, um, I don't need this, but I have a little brush, a little tiny, Sissy yep. brush, so we do it for sissy things. Um, you all right. Liquid glue, the liquid <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we take a, some stringing. You never finished your thought, by the way. Which one? get the thickness, of, the thickness of that to equal the thickness of your... Oh, you buy, buy the same veneer. <laughs> oh, okay. Because <laughs> I have the plane for you, exactly like you described. But if, if you were going to, if you were going to, 
the, the cross banding and this need to be the same thickness. If this was a little thicker, scrape it. It'll be fine. Okay? All right, so we want to put this down. And we want to get it in there. And then we want to walk this thing around and we want to miter it. Okay? So... Where's my little tiny... Where's my hammer? Where's everything? Oh. Oh, here it is. Okay, so we got this first piece down. We take the second piece. Well, uh, when I'm doing marquetry and stuff like this, I, I use a smaller one, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter. And the same rules apply to this. I mean, if you don't like the way it looks, put the iron on it. So now, <clears throat> I'm going to put this knife right on the corner of the, um, of the, the center field. And I'm going to look for the, where it joins the two pieces cross. And I'm just going to lean on it. And, of course, I didn't put it in the right spot, but you get the idea. I'm trying to get the next one. In fact, I'll show you what I would do if this was my actual, where's my, my, so if I had just done this and this was my piece and I said, I, I really am not happy with that because that's one of those six millimeter rule things, mm -hmm. okay? So we'll just heat this up. This took, this uh, iron turned itself off. I could reuse those, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to... Uh... So it's always good to have extra stringing. Try to get this thing right this time. Yeah, that's right. Do you have a box cutter for that too? You can use anything. Now like in marketry or parquetry, so you, can you or would you suggest using a technique where you press the fibers together? You take two overlapping things and they don't quite match, you could sit there and hammer it and crush the fibers together and it pretty much becomes invisible. Would, uh -huh. would you do that here or not? Um, I, I, prob I probably have done just about everything I do to make up for my mistakes, but yeah. um, 
I find that when people come to look at this stuff, the first thing they go for is your miters and your dovetails. Mm -hmm. So I would rather just, I mean, it's a little piece of string and just do it over. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's pretend I went around this whole thing. Yeah. Okay, it's, uh, now we're going to do the cross banding. Okay, so the things that happen with cross banding is you put this stuff down and it breaks or you pick it up and it breaks before you put it down and it just doesn't matter. Nobody's going to, these are, you go with strong grain on these types of things so you can just slide them together and that's it. So I'm going to start here and go, we're going to do a corner, but once you've seen one corner, you've seen them all, okay? <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to wet this, and the, the chalk is going, the chalk was over here, and it's going to the outside, so I've got to keep this orientation. I'm going to move it over, so I have to do a join. So this is a very strong grain wood, so you really never want to hammer across the grain if you can avoid it. Um, preferably, because you'll stretch it, and then tomorrow you'll come in and it'll be cracked. Okay? Because I already have a boatload of water on this thing, so it's already swelling. So, Okay, so you notice I didn't pay any attention to this edge. I didn't care. Okay? Yeah, I'm going to overlap it. So... So this is the worst case scenario. This isn't long enough, it's breaking, but I don't care. I'm so bold. Okay? <laughs> you could have done a black piece here too, right? It sure, if you, want, if you want to do black and white, then when that's set up, just put black around it and then put another white around it, do it, you know. You can, you can put uh, stringing around the world if you want. So. <laughs> So I'm going to overlap these. Where do you get your veneer? Is that my wood? Uh, you yeah. You have a favorite place? That, that's where I go, yeah. Where do you go? Certainly, Certainly wood. I used to live out there, so I Upstate came. Upstate New York? Yeah. They're really nice uh, to work with. What's with this? So I'm going to use the veneer hammer as a hammer. So I'm going to lay this down. I pull this. And I pull this side off. I pick this one up. And I lay this down. Where's my, where's my little guy? Yeah. Oh, there it is. Okay. So. Um, you, you were watching that. Uh, I guarantee you tomorrow you came here, you could not find, you will not find that joint. It's, it's gone. So I want to add this piece. Wow. Would you ever miter that corner? I will. Like I said, this is the worst possible scenario. I mean, I've, I got it right at a miter, it broke, and yada, yada, yada. So if I was doing this myself, I probably would have replaced that, not used such a fragile piece here, but I wanted to be able to talk about all the horrible things that could go wrong. Okay, so. Standing up or sitting down. This looks like this could get harder on your back. Yeah, I, my workbench when I do this is about this high. Yeah. I have a secondary bench I use. Because, yeah, my back is talking to me right now. It's saying, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I 
Okay, so now we would take another piece, the chatoyance, everything goes out, okay? Mm -hmm. It's really pretty cross bending, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It really makes a difference. It makes a big difference. It brings out the white, too, in the, in the holly. Can we move that iron thing? No, no, you're fine. It's no, just, just the iron just was perfectly placed. Right? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to overlap it. Right in front of you. Right in front of me. <laughs> Thank you. That's the blind spot. kind of thing that happens when you're working in a place that's not your own and set, not set up the way you're used to it. I'm still a mess in my own workshop. So. <laughs> but thank you for oh, giving me that. <laughs> All right, where's my little... <laughs> it's great. <laughs> okay, so, so we've got this corner here, and we've got the intersection of these two here, and that's what we're shooting for. Okay, so we drop it down on there, and we drop it down on there. Ah, it moved. So this isn't going to be square because I just screwed it up. But we could do it over. No, that's not a problem. Save it. This didn't go through. No, because the end, yeah, your handle interfered. Yeah, there you go. So because this stuff is so brittle, this, this corner breaking off is not uncommon at all, but it as I was saying before, it just doesn't matter. You just put it back in, and we have to cut this one down. Have that iron. Okay, so aside from the fact that I moved this and it's not a, uh, exactly at a miter and I broke off this corner, it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what I would do, again, is I would simply take the iron and take these two pieces off and do it until I get it right. Um, you don't get that chance with PVA glue. Um, and you don't have to vacuum or press this at all when you're done? No, it's done. So why would people pick the vacuum thing, which seems very complicated, over this? I don't know. That's why I don't. Because I do that at work for odd, very complicated shapes. Oh. And you want to also, and you want to get also, a constant pressure. It also is very, useful if yeah. you're doing huge pieces. Yep. Like uh, a friend pieces. of mine had to do uh, two doors, mm -hmm. which were ten foot high, and this <clears> wide for a historic house. Yep. And he used. Unibon, a, the Unibon mm -hmm. and, and a vacuum bag yeah. because they're just huge things to, to veneer. Yeah. So another benefit to considering hide glue for this, even if you were going to do it in a vacuum bag and using uh, liquid hide glue, is that these veneers are getting so thin that it's almost impossible to not get bleed through. And if you're going to have to worry about that, then hide glue is the way to go. Okay? Do you think if you're finishing it all, you don't have to worry about getting every little bit off the top? No. no. So it's fine. 
No, it, in, in fact, in fact, what I would do next with this, after it all dried up, is I would paint hide glue over the whole top of it and use it as a filler. Because this, this is nice and smooth. This has got open grain, so we want to fill it. And I'm going to talk about that next. Do you want me to do more of this, or are we good no, with this? No, that's yeah. fine. Okay. It's a great filler for mahogany. Yeah. So, uh, you were talking about sizing the ends of the MDF. Right. You know, it just sucks up too much glue. Right. Can you do that with your typical PVA and water mixture, size it, and then do high glue? I guess you could, sure. I mean, the two should stick together. Um, we're going to need the, yeah, we don't need that anymore. We're going to do a present um, on the screen. Okay, let me, uh, let me stop this. Glue is, is um, make uh, filler with, use it as a filler as opposed to buying all that plastic stuff or a lot of the oil-based stuff, because filling is a really sloppy operation. Um, so in this book, uh, which is where I learned about it, that little, I don't know where it went, that li the little green book, it has a paragraph in it that talks about this, and they basically said that you mix a pound of glue with a gallon of water, which is about an eight to one by weight mixture. So what I do with my standard, my standard mixture, since I know what the ratio of the water to the glue is, I've come up with a rule that says however much glue you have, add enough water to go between two or three times that, and you've got sizing. Okay, you've got filler. Uh, so that avoids having to come up with new mixtures and all that other stuff. Thank you. Um, so you, you simply take, it's, it's pretty watery. Um, you simply take it, you brush it on, and um, you go away. And then you come back the next day, and this is a little video of um, using the filler on that table. And I, hopefully it's loud enough. Was scraped first and then sanded with uh, 320 grit sandpaper in a random orbit sander. And then I applied a generous coat of watered down hot hide glue uh, to the entire surface to fill the pores uh, and I left it overnight. So now I'm going to scrape off the um, hide glue. So what you're seeing coming off here is all glue. It's not uh, there's no wood being scraped off at all, uh, which is exactly what I'm looking for. Just want to remove the glue from the top and leave the um, leave the glue in the pores. And because high glue is, doesn't affect the finish. Um, the little bit of glue that's left in the pores so won't have any impact on the uh, on the coloration or the application of any of the um, any of the top coats. And what's going on here will be a coat of a coat or two of, um, of de-waxed shellac, maybe a one-pound cut, and then I'm going to put multiple coats of water box on top of that. When you start seeing the dark stuff, then you know you're going down into the into the wood itself, but that doesn't matter either. This feels like a very small amount of oil.
Okay, so that's what it looks like with the filler and the shellac and the water locks. Okay? So if you haven't tried that, give it a shot. Now, I said between two and three. So if you're, if you're doing this with... If you're doing this with hardwood, it doesn't matter. You know, do whatever you like. If you're doing it on top of a board that you veneered, you really don't want it too watered down. You want, you want to get, get it on there. Don't, rub, don't be rubbing it and poking at it. Get it on and walk away because you're going to lift the veneer. Okay? So this is one you should practice a little bit under adult supervision if you're going to do it on, on veneer. Okay? Okay. The last piece of this is <coughs> that table that had that, that ray finish. The methods for doing that are a little bit different. So I have a video here that I presented to some other group on how to do that. This board was made after I made the table to use as a demo. All right. Um, is this something you want to see or? Yeah. yeah? Okay. The back is ribbon mahogany. Below this I have a layer that goes across, so the, the poplar is running this way. There's a layer of mahogany that's running across it, and then this is the finish layer for the back running perpendicular to the layer below it. Um, that should add some stability to this top uh, from a cupping and twisting perspective. Beneath this uh, ray pattern is a layer of uh, mahogany veneer running sideways. Again, the poplar is running north uh, the, along the long axis. And as you can see, the rays are um, pointing in 360 degrees. Um, when this top is finished, it'll have um, a pattern in the middle. We haven't decided yet on what that's going to look like. And there'll be some... Uh, purfling or banding around the top corner of this. Uh, it's probably going to be a rope design with ebony and holly. And uh, that then this top will be finished. But what I'd like to take you through is the process for laying out um, and uh, veneering the, um, the ray pattern that's here. Okay, so I set up this uh, piece of MDF as our substrate. If this was really uh, going to be a tabletop, MDF is a perfectly suitable substrate. In fact, it's a very good substrate for it. Um, you wouldn't really have to cross band it. Um, you can just put the veneer down on it front and back and it would probably do just fine. Uh, and I'm using a three quarter inch board. If I was making a tabletop for a federal piece, I would start with a half inch board because those tops were much thinner. They wound up, you know, somewhere in the 5 eighths plus range. <clears throat> now this is not a complete tabletop because I don't want to do this 16 times. I'm going to do the bottom half and I'm going to do one point to show you how when you start, how you finish um, uh, by leaving the, the one you start with overlap. So I'm going to do this top down to here and then I'll come back as if I went around the bottom and do this one here. I have all my veneers cut and trued on one side and stacked in order. I'm going to start on number 13. It is the uh, it is on the exact on the minor axis and it is the only piece that we start with um, that is got a jointed line on the left. Now we do this because when we put this in, we want this very close to this line. And if we can hammer it down on the line, we're fine. If we can't, we want to make go past the line just a little bit and then we'll knife it 
to its uh, final surface. And we want enough of this to be hanging over the, um, the other side of the minor ellipse. So I'm going to cut this here to here because we don't need all of this stuff. It's just going to make it harder for us to, uh, to finish this thing off. So let me, let me get rid of this excess. And this doesn't have to be at all accurate, and it doesn't matter if it breaks out because we're going to be cutting this edge off later on. So this is the first piece we lay in. <clears throat> so this piece will go in here, and we want it to go past the center, and then we want to get number 14 and we'll put 14 in here and butt it up against this one because the right side of 14 has been trued. We'll then lay our straight edge down on this line and we'll cut the left side of 14 and then we will take 15 this is 14 we will take 15 and butt it up against that edge and just walk this around same process, butt this side, cut this side, butt this side, cut that side, and you just walk around the, uh, the, um, the tabletop. Couldn't be simpler. So I'm going to put these back in order, and we're going to lay down our first um, piece. Now I'm going to get these rags wet. That is pretty hot. Bring it out pretty well. I'm just going to wet this down a little bit. Dampen this. Dampen this. And I've got my iron on in case I need to free up this. Uh, so I want to go over the line with the glue on both sides. Lay this in and see if I can get it on that line. And then I'm, now I'm ready to do the next one. So I just lay down some glue. This glue is a little thick. I think I'm going to thin it out a little bit. So I take number 14, straight edge and we line it up this line and we cut through it and you want to listen because you can hear when you're through I'll pick this up and this is stuck down pretty I can get this off but to show you what the iron is for if we take the iron and put it on here this will lift right off so that comes off this little piece of this bottom piece comes off I want to keep this knife reasonably clean this is 
So this glue set up and it was up a little bit. I didn't hammer enough out of it, squeeze it out. So I just reactivate it and you can see the glue squeeze out. Okay, now we're ready for and we put it down on here and the heat from this new glue reactivates the old glue. This is 15. It doesn't hurt to use your fingers to pull this together if it's not being friendly to you. And uh, probably the least important part of this table is right here in the dead center because we're going to put an inlay in there. Okay, so now we need to cut the left side of this. So you get the line, the center point, and this line, and This glue is drying fast. As you can see, this moves along pretty briskly. Definitely left this too long. Can't even see the lines. There it is. It's best not to have any glue on the surface if you're going to 
put the iron down, but I want to reactivate this glue because it was uh, pretty dry when I put this down. You can see this one is buckling here. This one may be a problem piece. Yeah, this one's going to be fun. So this piece was left way too big, there's no glue to hold it down. I got it wet, now it's curling, so I have nobody to blame but myself for this little problem, but might as well see it. So if I wet this side, this thing should lay down again. I got glue underneath here, and there it goes. So I'm just going to heat this, wipe off the glue, and heat this up one more time. I think we have averted the tragedy. So that was poor, yeah, you can see the glue squeezing out underneath that. So that was poor preparation on my part, leaving this piece way too big. You've just witnessed the two stupid things you can do in this process. There aren't that many stupid things to do. I think I've covered them all. Okay, so let's assume we keep going around and we want to come to this last piece, number 12. Now, this first piece is already over the center line. So when I lay this piece down, I want to lay it over that center line again. And it will, the right side would have been butted up against whatever piece of veneer was, was here, because I'm coming around. So that's butted up against it. This is overlapping and I'm going to cut it on that line, okay? And that's how both of these are going to... Um, so when I'm putting this last piece in, I probably want a half an inch of overlap. On the left side of, on the left side of this, so... That's, this glue is almost done here, it's totally thick. It's another example of how forgiving high glue is. So I'm going to put this down. This is going to align with the piece of veneer that was over here. I'm going to make sure we're past the center line. Okay, now hammer this down. Now we take the, so this is going to line up with this line and the line that's over here that says the center line. And theoretically, I'm going to be cutting through two pieces of veneer at this point. I can feel like I'm through it. So we'll see if we in fact did get two pieces of veneer. This one picks up. 
after I heat it up. Pick this one up, and then we pick up this piece that's under here. And then this one sits down in there. And that's how the last piece goes in. If you get it, there it goes. And we gotta hammer this down. I'm gonna get some of this wet glue off here. With this drying glue, and then we're going to hammer it down again and reactivate that glue. So, you see all that glue coming out from under there. What that was was glue that it set up. So that when I hammered it, it was too thick to squeeze out, and that's not good because that will leave bubbles and, and whatnot underneath there. Okay, so if we had uh, gone around completely, that's how we would have kept adding pieces, and this, that's how that last piece goes in. So remember, the first piece wants to overlap on both sides. If you can get a butt joint to start on the left side, that's great. Otherwise, overlap it on both sides and then cut it. And uh, this center didn't come out. I, I must have used a bad line somewhere. Because um, all of these should come out pretty much dead nuts on, and this number three is off. <coughs> but if you look at... Look at this one, they're much, they're not perfect, but they're much closer to the center. It's going to be completely irrelevant because something somewhat bigger than this is going to go in here. So those points that you have at the end are going to go away. This, this glue can, this stuff. Okay, while I was waiting for this, I was feeling around and I felt like this edge is coming up. Now, since this edge isn't attached to anything, I could just heat this whole thing and slide it around. But uh, in real life, this would be wedged between two pieces of uh, veneer. So what I'm going to do with this is exactly what I did with the other one. I'm going to heat up this block. I'm going to heat up this section here. And wet it and I'm going to put that block on it and see if we can get this to to lay down okay so we're going to wet this I'm going to heat it I'm going to hammer it because I should be able to fix a good deal of this with the hammer Okay, you can see that glue coming out. It's down exactly the way you would want it to be. But I'm still going to You want that block hot enough to reactivate the glue. This pushes it down and then a few minutes later you take it off and theoretically you're good. So we'll see. Well it's uh, overnight. Um, if where we left off I was having trouble getting this uh, ready to lay down. It kept coming back up. And that was because I was taking the uh, heated block off too soon. 
to try to keep in line with the timing of the video. So I just clamped it on, heated it up, put some water on it, heated it up, heated up the, uh, the uh, block and clamped it down and left it overnight. And as you can see, it's down and it's not getting up. I also had to put a block over here. I had to water this and hammer it a little bit. There was a lot of glue under there. And I uh, put the block on there and um, that's down. So with any hammer veneering job, the, uh, after it uh, you give it overnight, you want to go around with your fingernails and you're listening for hollow sounds. A hollow sound would indicate that there is a bubble underneath there. And I don't have any. But it would be very distinctive. It would be a hollow sound and the process is the same. Put some water on it, heat it up with an iron, uh, put a heated block on it, clamp it down, and leave it for 20 minutes, 15 minutes, something like that. And um, 99 times out of 100 it'll stay down. Uh, if it's glue starved under there, you'll have to cut it with a uh, knife, uh, inject some glue under there, um, heat it up and clamp it down again and it'll stay down. So the nice thing about high glue is you can keep working it until it uh, does what you want it to do. So as you can also see, I've drawn the shape of the ellipse on here. Uh, I'm going to bandsaw this off and then I'm going to route the edges. Um, if you remember the picture I showed you in the beginning, there was barber pole banding that goes around the outside and then this cross banding around the edges. Um, we're kind of out of time so that's for another day, but those are interesting processes because um, I, I don't know how you would do the barber pole without hide glue. Um, the, the other stuff I guess you could do with, with PVA. Um, are there any questions? You have to worry, I won't call it the coefficient of thermal expansion, but the coefficient of moisture absorption. Because people get crazy with these exotic woods. Do you have to worry about? Yeah, in fact, when I made the original top, if I can, uh, one of those pieces, one of those pieces the day after I made it, was was um, it picked up like the, the joint between the two pieces kind of rose up on both sides, but only towards the top because the the pie shape it was really big at the top. So as I wet it, it was able to stretch, um, and at the bottom didn't. So it created this. I get the bottom there was a fit, the top there wasn't a fit, and I wound up having to actually you know, put a straight edge, lay it down, and they kind of overlapped like that, and I had to lay a straight edge down on it, heat it up, wet it up, and pull, a, pull another line. So I treated it like the last, uh, last piece that went in and it came out okay. Yes? What did you say your source was for uh, Certainly would, cer yeah, certainly, right. yeah, yeah, certainly right. would. A pateré. Um, how would you go about cutting that out? You wait till it dries? Or oh yeah, 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 yeah. No, that that top is done. I would let it sit for a day or so two. You and just cut it out. You wouldn't have to heat it up again to cut out the, cut out the middle. Or would you no, no. I would treat it like a solid piece of wood after that. Um, so I I make my pateré, and and then I put the stringing on the pateré that I made, and then I just lay it down and knife a line and excavate it and drop it in. Okay.